Hi, my name is Pete Sloan and I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician practicing out of Baltimore, Maryland. Today I'd like to present the first of a three-part series on the fundamentals of mechanical ventilation. I've had numerous requests to add this topic to my series of presentation on basic topics in critical care medicine that I hope you will enjoy on my YouTube channel, Peter Sloan, MD. Today I'll be covering the fundamentals of pathophysiology and lung mechanics that you will need to know to better understand mechanical ventilation strategies. On subsequent videos, I will review modes of ventilation, weaning and extubation strategies, and several other topics. I hope you will continue to the end of this series and then check out my other videos at Peter Sloan, MD. Indications for mechanical ventilation include hypercapnic respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, mixed hypercapnic and hypoxemic respiratory failure, impending respiratory failure, and routine use of mechanical ventilation, such as general anesthesia cases. Goals of ventilation include achieving adequate ventilation with a pH over 7.3, acceptable oxygenation with a PO2 over 60 or saturations over 90%, preventing ventilator-induced lung injury by avoiding oxygen-free radical toxicity, barotrauma, volume trauma, atelic trauma, and if necessary, considering use of a permissive hypercapnia strategy, patient comfort and synchrony, and of course, earliest possible wean. Permissive hypercapnia is intentional, intentionally allowing elevation of PCO2, provided pH remains acceptable at 7.2 or so, to allow achievement of goals of therapy in the difficult to ventilate patients, such as a severe asthmatic or ARDS patient. Advantages of permissive hypercapnia is it allows us to achieve low tidal volume and low pressure goals, but disadvantages include acidosis, CNS dysfunction, elevated intracranial pressure, secondary muscle weakness, slightly higher FiO2 requirement, and suppressed respiratory drive. Volume trauma is a type of ventilator-induced lung injury related to damage to lung epithelium by stretching the lungs to extreme of lung volumes. Stretch also incites inflammatory reaction with release of cytokines and is borne out in animal models and clinical trials. Large tidal volume ventilation is an independent predictor of lung injury. In the ARDS network study, comparing conventional versus low tidal volume ventilation, the proportion of patients who survived was significantly higher in the low tidal volume strategy compared with the traditional tidal volume strategy. And in addition, length of stay in ICU was shortened as was number of days on mechanical ventilation. Types of barotrauma include pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, and subcutaneous emphysema. Adelic trauma is lung injury caused by allowing alveoli to repetitively collapse and reinflate. This occurs when PEEP is low and expiratory time is long enough to allow deflation. Here's a graph of the volume pressure relationship of a healthy lung. In a healthy lung, we achieve a relatively normal tidal volume with a small pressure. In ARDS, to re to, with a stiff lung, in order to deliver a regular size tidal volume, we need high pressure. The slope of this graph, delta V over delta P, is the compliance. In this case, a high slope or high compliance means healthy lungs, and a low slope or low compliance means stiff ARDS type lungs. Benefits of PEEP include alveolar recruitment, prevention of expiratory collapse of alveoli, reversal of microatelectasis, increased functional residual capacity, improved lung compliance by shifting the patient's lung volumes to the more favorable part of the pressure volume curve, improved shunt fraction, and improved gas exchange. Deleterious effects of PEEP include depression of cardiac performance by a tamponade effect on the pericardium, which decreases left ventricular transmural filling pressure, barotrauma, and regional hyperinflation and overdistension of the relatively unaffected areas of the lung. Types of ventilator breaths 
include a spontaneous breath the patient takes through the ventilator surface uh, circuit, which is a negative pressure breath. Two types of volume assisted breath, an assisted breath where the patient initiates the breath and once it's recognized, the machine delivers a tidal volume or a controlled breath where a timer delivers a tidal volume at a set timing interval. These are called volume cycled breaths. There are several types of breaths that are pressure cycled. Pressure support breath is a breath where the patient initiates the breath, but then the, the machine, the ventilator, keeps the breath at a target pressure for the duration of the patient's effort. A pressure controlled breath has a timer initiating the breath and then maintains the pressure at the target for a certain amount of time. A pressure release breath is a style of ventilation where we maintain the pressure at a high level of PEEP and then we release the breath for a short amount of time to keep the pressure maximally high as long as possible. These last three types of breaths are pressure cycled breaths. In volume cycled breaths, the peak airway pressure depends on how large the breath, the lung mechanics, and the patient effort. Where in pressure cycled breath, the volume that's delivered depends on how much pressure we deliver and also patient's effort and lung mechanical properties. Three of these breaths I've just demonstrated are triggered by the patient, a spontaneous breath, an assisted breath, and a supported breath, where the other three breaths demonstrated in this slide are machine triggered by a timer. So the three T's of individual, individual ventilator breaths are the trigger which is what starts the breath. Either a timer could start the breath or the patient's effort could start the breath as I just showed you. The target of the breath could either be a flow rate and pattern or a pressure target. Termination can be when the volume is reached or time is reached in a set time or the flow required reaches a critically low value showing that the patient's finished inhaling. That's the last one of these is seen in pressure support ventilation. This is the anatomy of a volume cycled ventilator breath. The breath starts at a low pressure called CPAP or PEEP, in this case six, and then after the volume is delivered, the peak area pressure goes up to a high value, in this case 22, that depends on the volume, the lung compliance, and the patient's effort. The mean pressure is the average pressure, and in this case, nine is closer to six because the patient spends much more time at the lower pressure and is only at the peak pressure for a short amount of time. The sensitivity trigger is how negative the pressure has to pull flow or pressure to get the ventilator to recognize they're making an effort. In this case, there is a pressure trigger of about minus four. In a pressure cycled breath, the PEEP low is set, and then we either set the target pressure as PEEP high, or in some modes, we set the inspiratory pressure above PEEP to achieve the PEEP high. But either way, the PEEP high is the PEEP low plus the inspiratory pressure. We also set the inspiratory time and the rate, and that leaves a given amount of expiratory time and fixes the IDE ratio. In this example, the inspiratory time is higher than the expiratory time, and it's a square wave, so that the mean airway pressure of 16 is much closer to 22 than the prior when it was nine, because of the average pressure being high related to the long interval of time and holding the breath at 22 for the entire duration of inhalation. This is um, a graph of Ohm's law, P equals IR. It's, um, this is the relationship of driving pressure versus flow in laminar flow. In a no flow state, the pressure at both ends of the system is equilibrated. But to create flow through a normal resistance and a normal amount of flow, we need to gently elevate the proximal pressure. If we want more flow, we have to raise the pressure more or to get a normal amount of flow through a high resistance, we have to raise the pressure more. So if we have a high flow or a high resistance, we'll need more pressure. Of course, if we simultaneously have a high flow requirement against the high resistance, we'll need the highest pressure. 
Lung compliance is defined as how much volume we get for a given pressure change. We can solve this for the pressure required ha is, is related to the size of the volume divided by the compliance, meaning larger volumes or lower compliance lungs require higher pressure. Let me show you that with some pictures. Here's a normal size lung inflating to um, with a normal with a normal um, compliance designated by the green rim around the lung. This lung only requires a low pressure. Here's an example of a normal size lung volume inflating against stiff lungs or a low compliance requiring higher pressure. Likewise, a normal compliant lung re requ requiring a higher volume of inflation will need a higher pressure. If we combine these two effects and try to inflate a stiff lung to a large volume, we need the most pressure. We can measure the compliance on a ventilator. Here's a screenshot off of the 7200 Puritan Bennett ventilator that I took to get ready for this talk that shows total volumes being delivered about 600 cc's with a set flow pattern so that the volume goes in and generates a pressure curve. Notice the peak pressure of 22 is determined by a combination of the volume and the flow against the compliance and resistance. In this patient, we placed an end inspiratory hold to allow any pressure that was going over the flow resistance to dissipate, meaning during the breath hold, the only pressure left in the lungs was the inflation pressure to stretch the lungs to a total volume of 600. So I'm going to show you that a little closer. In this example, the peak was 6 and the peak pressure was 22. Again, this is the pressure required to both stretch the lung to 600 cc's and to deliver the flow. However, during a plateau maneuver, the flow is zero, so all of the pressure that was across the resistance is dissipated by no flow state. So the only pressure that's remaining is called the plateau pressure, in this case, 20. That's the stretching pressure of the lung used in compliance calculations. So to calculate compliance, we look at the volume change divided by pressure change. The tidal volume that was delivered was 600 or 595, and the pressure change was the peep of six up to the plateau of 20, which is 14. So we calculate the compliance at 595 divided by 14, which is 43 cc's of inflation per centimeter of water. The resistance is the extra pressure above the plateau that had been going across the flow when flow was present. So notice when flow was present, there was a little extra pressure. So the amount of pressure is two is 22 above 20. It's only two of centimeters of water pressure above the plateau. That two centimeters is the driving pressure across resistance divided by the flow, which we set on the machine at 1.2 liters per second, lets us calculate resistance. In this case, the resistance is very low. I, I will say this is probably the most confusing slide I'll show you, so you can study it a little bit, but this just shows how we measure the lung mechanics. On that note, this talk will be continued. The main part of the talk are the modes of ventilation coming up in part two. If you can't navigate to it easily in YouTube, just search for Peter Sloan MD in the YouTube main search box. I really thank you for watching this talk and hope you'll continue on to parts two and part three. Thanks.